Okay, so welcome again uh, to everybody to this uh, PCMA seminar, which is I think every week, every two weeks, uh, usually, or regularly, more or less, <laughs> uh, to showcase a little bit uh, the current research at the Polish Center of Military Archaeology at the University of Warsaw. And today, uh, the theme is on textile archaeology. The seminar comes as a sort of conclusion uh, to a project that I have been conducted since April of last year uh, on textile archaeology and specifically on funerary textiles. Um, but I thought that since I'm finishing today, it would be also uh, very nice to showcase uh, textile archaeology and textile research in Nubia because it has been um, kind of like developing quite a lot in the past few years, very several projects um, ongoing some for many years, uh, as John Peter uh, will show you, some relatively new ones, uh, as Magda will also uh, introduce. So I thought it was going to be a very nice uh, occasion to show different methods, but also approaches to textile research, um, because uh, you will see that uh, the three of us have very different approaches in different projects. Um, so um, yeah. So you can see a little bit what's going on in textile research and all the material that is uh, being excavated or studied mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, just to show you a little bit uh, the program. Uh, so we'll start by a presentation on uh, the meritic clothing from a site um, in Egyptian Nubia called Cassie Brim. And John Peter will uh, detail his current work and questions on a specific technique called blue piping. John Peter is, uh, you could say, really one of the founders of textile archaeology. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Manchester. He has been working uh, on many important Roman sites, uh, for example, the fort of uh, Vindolenda in Roman Britain, but also in Berenike and in Cassibrim um, in Nubia. Uh, so he will share with us his expertise uh, on textile techniques and textile um, studies in the field. Then Magdalena Wozniak will present a presentation on another kind of method, another kind of approaches to see how we can go beyond uh, technical textile analysis and to look at the opportunities and limitations of chemical analysis. Uh, Magda uh, is adjunct at the PCMA and has been in many other things uh, my supervisor on my projects and my very, very dear colleague. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to present her work here today. She's a textile archaeologist. She has been working for many years now with medieval material, uh, archaeological finds, but also the iconography of costumes uh, in medieval Nubia. And she's at the moment employing herself on the very many uh, textiles found during the old Angola excavation as part of the Yuma um, ERC project at the PCMA. And then I think after that, we could uh, take a little break for co coffee refill or whatnot. And I will then present um, the project that I have been leading at the center, uh, which is called Unraveling Nubian Funerary Practices. So without further ado, I will stop sharing this. And please, John Peter, if you could uh, share your screen, you can start your presentation. I should say just before I mute my microphone that uh, after each presentation, we can take a few questions if you have anything that's um, very specifically related to the material or something like this, you can share them from the chat, chat or just relay your questions. But at the end uh, of the free presentations, we can also have a more like free, freer um, discussion. All right, I will mute my microphone and uh, John Peter, the floor is yours. Right. You can hear me, that's the first thing. Right. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. You can hear me, good, <laughs> right, okay, I can start then. Um, before I begin this morning, I ought to emphasize that the phrase working notes in my title should be taken literally. It's work in progress, slow progress. Here's the old railway station at Chalau just south of Aswan. Once it was on Lord Kitchener's railway line south to Wadi Halfa, 
but in 2005, it was serving as the antiquities store for finds from Casare Bream, from recent excavations anyway. Pam Rose very kindly invited Felicity and myself to record the textiles kept there from her most recent excavations. There are a lot more besides. Uh, and we're indebted to her for uh, a lot of the photographs I'll be using this morning. While at Shalal, we developed an interest in a Meroitic textile technique applied to cotton fabrics, which I've called for convenience piping. Here's an example. Our embroidery colleagues um, don't approve of this term's use in this context, but uh, I've yet to find a better word. In essence, it's an elaborate form of decorative hem created on raw cloth edge to reinforce and enhance it. Taking the fine medium cotton tabby 0605 uh, as a template, uh, a piped hem has a number of standard elements. First of all, the cloth foundation, a rolled hem containing an invisible cord, an inner blue piping cord in the step between the cloth and the um, hem, and a second blue cord out here um, attached to the outer edge of the hem. This latter cord, however, is often worn away completely, um, but the stubs roughly here and there of the anchoring yarn are still sometimes visible. For us, the challenge was to work out how the various components were linked together. Stage one. To begin construction, the cloth with its raw edge is laid flat, like this, there's the raw edge, and an undyed thread, Z plied from three S-spun yarns, um, is placed to, close to it, that's a distance away. On the other side, here, Directly opposite, so it's quite difficult to show in drawing properly, a blue piping cord was positioned. And there's about eight millimeter intervals. A blue sewing thread was passed through the cloth and round both cords inside and outside, anchoring them to their respective places. After that, the raw edge was folded over, concealing that. And the sewing yarn for the hem was again undyed three ply thread. The undyed thread re remains hidden inside the hem. And the hemming stitches here work Z when you see them on the back there, holds in place. The back actually is a good place to start analyzing because you get just two sets of, of threads and not a multiplicity. The undyed thread remains hidden throughout. Uh, the inner piping cord is added next, assuming that already exists. Inner piping cord there. It's um, three untwisted pairs um, of S-spun 
blue yarn and given a very gentle S twist, Z twist rather, overall. And it's about um, one and a half millimeters thick. The same pair out of the three. Uh, come up. Here um, is then anchored. Um, it's grasped consistently by a sewing thread here, um, there, and there. Couching, in other words. And that's Z plied from three S bon yarns, as always. This thread is functionally distinct from the identical undyed three ply hemming thread that secures the rolled hems in the edge. So you can see them separate on the back there. The outer piping cord on this particular example, I'm quoting 060645, is actually missing. But we can reconstruct it um, in the light of some better examples. Uh, and its structure, I think, I'm sure, is the same as that of the inner piping cord. Some 22 of the 1700 textile fragments, which we, or Felicity and myself, recorded at Chalel, have piped um, blue hems. But the frequent deviation from the pattern, the structural template, which I've just um, I tried to explain to you. Um, some apparent variation, of course, might have been caused by wear damage. You've always got to remember that. Um, and that's quite common, no problem. Some of it, of course, could be due to my inability to record accurately what survives. Um, I think it was certainly a, a brain teaser. Um, but of course, one can't destroy too much. Um, you've got to leave it in case somebody else can have a better idea later on. So at some point in which you've got to say, OK, sorry, can't do it any better than that. That's our best guess. Um, otherwise, um, there are, where well, one's sure, um, certain deviations um, from the standard practice. And here's just one example. In textile 20215, sorry, it's slightly out of focus, there's the back view, um, which is that, and which is this. And the stitches there. Um, the undyed three ply cord, the captured thread that secures the successive yarn pairs in the cord, in the blue cord, um, is pulled so tight by the person doing the work that it draws one pair out of that piping cord through the cloth and makes it visible on the other side. So this um, couching thread is absolutely straight and it's the piping cord that yields up its thread to pass through and form the link. This is in contrast, as I've said, to the template I've just been showing you, which was actually slightly simpler. But this occurs so often, this variation, that it must, it's not just um, a mistake, it's work in practice. Evidently, individual workers had their own um, ideas and they were allowed to have them. Um, I haven't quoted you any dimensions so far. Um, despite what my photographs might imply, um, the hems were quite narrow, between three and five millimeters um, across. And um, that depends, of course, on the quality of the weave. Uh, they contained invisibly here again, the invisible cord, and that was about a millimeter thick. And the piping cords 
at their best were about 1.8 um, meters across. And they were couched and anchored at roughly four, five, six um, millimeters intervals. Um, most of our piping hems are scraps torn out of their original setting, but just a few are intrinsically interesting. Textile number 1030 is a small hoodie. Um, it had, it's about 51 centimetres top to bottom um, and 13 centimetres back to front along the apex, along here. Uh, and it's about the right size for, size for a, a very small child. Uh, in, it had piping of the standard type down the front and across the apex. In other words, you can't see it because it's undyed there and here and across the apex. Um, on the apex, the two uh, sets of piping cord are held end to end and then loosely sewn and then reinforced stitching in four to five places in blue over the top. There's just a trace on the end here, back end of a bubble, which is another splendid and meritic uh, characteristic. And there they are, um, again, drawn out. And you can see here the tuck that was put into the shoulder to adjust the size for the particular child that was wearing it at the time. Another child's garment showing piping is what I've called a, a tabard. Uh, again, I, I couldn't really find a proper expression. It's really a tunic, which is um, open down both sides. No sign of any stitching being there originally. There it is in outline, and here are the bubbles, which are top and bottom. This is the direction of weft, the right direction of warp, and weft is across here. Um, at about the midway point, the warp's been cut to allow for a neck, neck aperture, about um, 23 centimetres long. Um, the edges of which are hemmed and blue piped. At opposite ends of the aperture, at A and B, the piping cords um, behave differently. At A, the outer cord as its starting and finishing ends brought together and drawn outwards towards the shoulder um, over the inner cord. And the inner cord continues, as you see here, underneath the whole assemblage. Um, it's loose end and ends with ends sewn down with these, with these knots. And at B, unsurprisingly, it's exactly the reverse. So uh, it allows for damage to the neck, which you get you're expected with small children, uh, because that's that perhaps really is the weak point. Next. A mystery. What is this textile? What was its function? This is how I first photographed it, um, really just to show up the, the piping here and all the way around here and off into the distance here. 
and there's a detail before we actually try to flatten it. That's how I photographed it first. Uh, I tried again, folding it over. That's the crease, that's the fold. And I left it like this. This, of course, is open, except for here, where there's the single blue stitch, which I showed on the previous slide. So we consulted Nettie Adams, <clears throat> um, who had just written, actually, a, a paper which contained a series of what she called mystery objects. This is one of them. There's a distinct similarity. That's the crease, the fold, and here's the blue piping. But on hers, the blue piping is sewn up. So it's closed. I'm not sure whether that's open or closed, but certainly here it is. And it seems to tail off there. Um, that doesn't make much sense either. And Nettie had no real suggestions. Uh, and wherever I've shown pictures of this, I've had incomprehension again. It, it seems to be more or less complete, apart from little bits missing, but I've no idea really what it was. Pipe hems are common in Meroitic times, <clears throat> but much less so in the post Meroitic. Post Meroitic, I think we need not four examples. Uh, and those, of course, could be redeposited, so one can't say they definitely um, exclude post Meroitic or whatever it's called. Um, <clears throat> they have not been found north of the first cataract. Um, the nearest e equivalent there inside the Roman Empire is so called foot weaving. It's a Scandinavian expression, I, I think and involves a narrow, integrated border added on to a raw edge. <clears throat> there is a detail, and you can see it's a bit of colour retention, slightly reddish. How it's produced? Well, that's a, an easy diagram to draw, but it doesn't actually say how the work was done. Which is the active system, which is the passive system. Foot weaving, I think, was invented because it was assumed that you need your, your, your feet as well as your hands um, to do the, the job of, of, of sewing and weaving at the same time. But it's common enough now to say that it's a regular technique everywhere in the empire, and even at Vinderlande. We've got an example there. Uh, what tends to happen is that although it's actually built right round the edge, um, it all gets pulled to one side. Uh, so that's the show side, if you like. Both pipe hem hems and foot weaving edges are decorative, clearly, and they're functional. Um, but did they also have apotropaic? Powers. Um, in Gujarat, one of my research students um, who was studying weaving locally was told by one of the local weavers um, that if a, law, a raw edge was left raw, the evil might get in. No explanation. But it explains why they were so careful about their edges. Maybe there's more to pipe Thames than meets our technical eye. Thank you for your attention.